Well, hi, friends, and welcome back to Small Group. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you've had a good week. And apologies again for Sunday. If you're part of our church family and you uh, were with us on Sunday, you'll know that there was some disruption, and I want to apologize. And uh, just a reminder that we will have our uh, rescheduled gathered service this coming Sunday. And so if you're not yet registered for church and would like to join us for church in person this weekend, then you can still uh, register online through this week by heading to our website or call the church and let us know that you'd like to come to church. If you had registered to attend church in person last Sunday, but aren't able to come this Sunday, let me know, please. And uh, we can take you off the list and that frees up space for somebody else to attend church. Thank you for your patience as we dealt with a whole lot through this past week. I'm hoping you've had time to uh, read already this evening, Revelation chapter 6. I need to stop saying this evening, don't I? I hope you've had a chance to read today in your group, whether you're meeting in the evening or in a daytime group, Revelation chapter 6, and uh, we're looking through that today. Also, I'd like us to take today's passage in parallel, Revelation chapter 6, in parallel with Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 24. And so uh, you might also like to read that passage, Matthew 24, uh, and have a look through from verse 3 through to verse 35. And we're going to look at those two passages uh, in tandem today. Why don't we pray? Living God, would you once again speak to us right now, by your Spirit, through your words. Open our eyes to your words and our hearts to your Spirit. Encourage us, teach us, change us. Do great things in this time that we spend together right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Lovely stuff. Now, Any pastor or any doctor will know that someone that comes to present to them with an issue that they're facing, the issue that that person presents with is very rarely, if ever, the real issue or the only issue. Very rarely do you go to the doctor and say, here's what I'm facing, and the doctor clicks their fingers and prescribes a medicine and it's fixed. How much more often does the doctor need to perhaps arrange for some tests so that they can begin to scratch beneath the surface and find out what's really going on? Or the pastor, when someone comes to their door and sits down in their office and discusses one issue, well, actually, maybe there are two, three, four, five, six underlying issues and other things that first need to be exposed and explored before they can be solved. Well, it's the same as it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. Last week, we looked at Revelation chapter 5, and we saw God on the throne with this scroll in his hands, the scroll containing his blueprint, God's plans for the world. And there were seven seals on this scroll, and no one was able to open it, because all of us in some way have messed up and contributed to the mess that the world is in. Only Jesus was found to be worthy and deserving of opening the seals on this scroll. And as the Lamb takes the scroll from God on the throne, we can expect that as he undoes the scroll, everything is solved and game over. And yet we turn over the page and as Jesus begins to open the seals on the scroll, Well, the first four seals, there's these different colour horses with their riders who go and unleash all sorts of suffering and pain. But in this passage that we'll look at today, we will see that there are things which first need to be exposed and explored before they can be solved. Look with me in Matthew chapter 24. And as I said a a bit earlier, we're looking from verse 3 through to verse 35. And this is Jesus describing 
the events of the last days. It's Jesus telling his followers what will happen before his second coming. And these events of the last days, I'd like us to, as we look through them, remember what they are and the order that they come in. Because we look at it in parallel with what we see in Revelation chapter 6. These are what Jesus calls in Matthew 24 verse 8, the birth pains. Just the beginnings of what will happen immediately before Jesus returns again. Anyone watching who has been pregnant and given birth will know that birth pains increase steadily until such a time as the child is birthed. And Jesus describes events that had already started and will continue. They're going on right now and they will continue and increase in intensity until Jesus returns again. Here's what we see. Look with me. So verse 3, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, Uh, What sign will signal your return at the end of the world? And let's see the things that Jesus lists. The first one, verse 4 and 5. Jesus told them, Don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. If you're taking notes, jot down, verse 5, Antichrist. Let's carry on. Verse 6, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Jot down, verse 6, wars. Verse 7, nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. I want you to note down, famine. But this is only the first of the birth pains, verse 8, with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. Jot down, verse 9, killed or martyred. You'll be killed because of your faith in me. Uh, Jot down, verse 9, martyrs. And the list goes on. There's one more thing I'd like to point out in Matthew 24, and that is uh, in verse 29. Immediately, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the, uh, the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. Uh, So jot down uh, verse 29, the shaking that will happen. Uh, The sun will be dark and the moon will give no night uh, light. The stars will fall from the sky. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Uh, Keep a note of those things and the order in which they happen. Now let's look into Revelation chapter 6. And the seals that are described in this passage correspond to those events that Jesus describes uh, that immediately precede his second coming. We are in right now the time of, uh, that Jesus described as the, those birth pains, the time immediately preceding the end times. These days of the birth pains started in, in the first century in, in John's time and uh, 1 John chapter 2 Verse 18 describes it like this. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. That last hour, the last uh, events before Jesus' second coming, they started then, they're still going on now. And look at how the events in Revelation chapter 6, as the seals are broken, correspond with what Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24. As the first seal is broken. Revelation 6 verse 1. As I watched, the lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. 
Now, there are some people who say that this rider on a white horse with a crown on his head riding out to, 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 to win battles and gain the victory is Jesus. It is not. It is the Antichrist. How do we know? Well, number one, it's Jesus that has just opened the seal. It's unlikely that it would also be Jesus that rides out on the horse. Number two, Jesus on his white horse is described later in Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through to 16. Then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. That is Jesus on his white horse. What is described in Revelation 6, verse 2, is, is almost like a cheap imitation, isn't it? And that's what the Antichrist is. It's what is described as by Jesus. It appears on a white horse, something that normally symbolises peace and holiness and righteousness, and yet the, the rider's carrying a bow, this uh, weapon of warfare. Something that appears one thing but is actually destructive is exactly what Jesus described as the Antichrist in Matthew 24, verse 5. Don't be deceived. These four different coloured horses, I should have said earlier, correspond with imagery that Zechariah uses. And you can read in your own time, Zechariah chapters 1 and 6, and in those passages, the uh, four horses or the different colour horses represent divine instruments of judgment that are sent out by God uh, to exercise judgment on God's enemies. And these different coloured horses are sent out to uh, the different points of the compass, different geographical points. And we'll come back to that later on, uh, representing judgment that will be shown to all people. But the first seal corresponds with the Antichrist that Jesus describes, Matthew 24, verse 5. Then there's a second seal. Revelation 6, verse 3. When the Lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and authority to take peace from the earth, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. There you go. The second seal uh, brings with it war and lawlessness and violence and a disregard for life. Wars and rumours of war. Jesus described Matthew 24, verse 6. We saw it then, we see it now. The third seal. In verse 5, when the lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, come. I looked up, there was a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice say, a loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and wine. It's talking about a time of famine, a time where food will be so scarce that a loaf of bread will cost a day's pay. Poverty and famine described by Jesus, Matthew 24, verse 7. And what does war and violence and poverty and famine lead to? Let's open the fourth seal. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. I looked up, I saw a horse whose colour was pale green. Its rider was named Death and his companion the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals, death on a huge scale, wiping out a quarter of the earth. Jesus describing in Matthew 24 that people would be killed. The fifth seal 
describing the cry of the martyrs. Again, Jesus said, Matthew 24, that it would happen. As the fifth seal is open, the martyrs are described, they're shouting to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. This is Revelation 6, verse 10. How long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they've done to us? Then a white robe was given to them and they were told, I love this, to rest a little while longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. What do we see in John's vision as those who had been killed for their faith cried out to God and said, how long until you will uh, put this right? And they're told to wait because there's more to come. But the reference to the full number of their brothers and sisters. You see, each person who will suffer and die for their faith, each person who will pay a price for standing up for Jesus is known and counted. The sixth seal, verse 12. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree, shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. See these these cataclysmic events exactly as Jesus said, and in exactly the same order that Jesus described in Matthew chapter 24. And that's six seals, and if you're looking for the seventh, it comes in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, simply as a, as a prelude to these seven uh, trumpets that will come on to another time. But as we look through these seals and what they represent, there's just a couple of things that stand out as themes and reminders that I'd like to share with us this evening. Number one, the way in which everything happens exactly as Jesus said it would. The things that were happening in his time, the things that began in John's day and the things that continue in our day right now reminds us that there is nothing that happens beyond the knowledge and the sovereignty of God. It seems strange that after the incredible scenes we saw last week in chapter 5, as Jesus is identified as the one who is worthy to open the scroll, and there's this incredible scene of worship and praise, It seems strange that the next thing to happen should be all the pain and destruction being unleashed that is described. And yet what we see from these verses is that the pains that our world is facing right now must be allowed so that God can work his purpose. We see amazing things in Revelation chapter 21. At the end of the story, there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. But before you get to Revelation 21, you must have Revelation chapter 6. But notice, everything that happens, all the suffering, all the pain, the judgment that is unleashed, from the Antichrist that is unleashed in the first seal, notice that the crown was placed on his head. Notice that the rider of the second horse in verse 4 was given a mighty sword to bring about huge loss of life. And we see in that the sovereignty of God. That God gives permission to carry out an act that seems contrary to his character, but accomplishes his will. We see in these verses that God allows suffering, but that he has won the final victory. Look with me in Revelation chapter 17, a sneak preview. Revelation 17, verse 14. 
Together they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords and King of all kings, and his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. God allows suffering, but we know the end of the story. The victory is his. And finally, there's a reminder in here that God's judgment is a reality for all people. These four horses and their riders went out into all parts of the world. And the Bible tells us, Hebrews 9, verse 27, that just as each person is destined to die once and after that comes judgment, so also Christ died once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. Each person will die. Each person, no matter who they are, where they are, will face judgment. Each person who has trusted in Christ, no matter who they are, where they are, or what their story, will be saved. And I wonder, as we look at events that are going on in our world right now, as we see the deception, as we see wars and rumours of war, as we see poverty and famine, as we see people uh, being killed on an enormous scale and uh, believers being uh, persecuted and killed for their faith, I wonder if we just moan about it and put it down to... Uh, the times that we're living in and we vote for the political parties that promise to put these people in prison for longer? Or do we recognise that this fits exactly within God's plan for his created world? That all that is happening is happening exactly as Jesus said it would. And that it points to the next event in God's calendar, which is Jesus' second coming. I wonder if that inspires us and gives us uh, the energy and the desire to want to tell people about Jesus. To use the opportunity that we have to tell people the good news of Jesus so that as many people as possible can respond to it. Friends, let's not waste the opportunities that we have. Don't miss what's going on around us right now.